everybody. This is Patricia. Hope you guys are having a great 2016 so far. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I was supposed to put this video up in October. And it took me a long, long time for me to do it. I originally wrote the script around the tail end of As Told by Ginger Month. But the problem was is that I wasn't satisfied with it. So... What I did was is that I ditched the whole thing altogether and I basically started from scratch. And it took me a long time to write this uh, video script. I did a, a little bit more research on it. I found out some really interesting articles that I'm going to be discussing about. And I know that it's a bit late by three months. I hope it'll be well worth it because I took in a lot of time and I put in a lot of hours into doing the writing for this so i hope that you guys enjoy it it was the year 2000 the new millennium it was a time where everyone was trying to cap on the year due to how futuristic it sounded like pokemon the movie 2000 godzilla 2000 wheel of fortune 2000 goosebumps 2000 and many many more were examples on that Nickelodeon wanted to create new shows to generate toward a new audience, while at the same time keep the audience they gained a decade prior by releasing shows for teenagers. One of the shows was the second and last Nicktoon that aired that year. It was As Told by Ginger. As Told by Ginger focuses on mainly two characters, a teenage girl named Ginger Foutley going through her trials and tribulations of middle school alongside with her best friends Dodie Bishop, Macy Lightfoot, and Darren Patterson. The second person is Ginger's younger brother, Carl Foutley, as he and his best friend Robert Joseph Bishop, or Hoodsy, because he wears a purple hoodie, going through elementary school while pulling off a bunch of pranks, blackmailing schemes, or anything out of the ordinary or gross that that puts off a lot of normal-minded people. While the show sounds like your run-of-the-mill slice-of-life cartoon that ran rampant throughout the late 90s, there are numerous reasons on why As Told by Ginger stood among the crowd. And hopefully, to the best of my abilities, I'm going to answer today's topic. Why As Told by Ginger was groundbreaking yet overlooked in Nickelodeon. The first reason I want to bring up is that it was a lot more dramatic than most Nicktoons at the time. When you think of a Nicktoon that aired from 1991 to 2000, what do you think of? Cartoons with lots of variations of creativity? Characters that are varied from down-to-earth to wacky? Hours full of entertainment? Yes to all of them, but the answer I was getting across was that they were mostly comedic. Shows such as The Ren and Stimpy Show and Our Real Monsters relied on a lot of gross-out humor. Rocco's Modern Life and SpongeBob SquarePants relied on quick gags, subtle adult jokes that flew past children's heads, and memorable song cues. While it is true that programs such as Doug, Rugrats, and Hey Arnold also focus on slice-of-life aspects, they also relied on a dose of mostly comedy and a little dash of drama to make their messages more strong and relatable. As Told by Ginger takes these elements found on these previous Nicktoons and elevates it to a whole other level. It treats the characters and situations very seriously, and it never talks down to its audience to deliver its messages. Which brings me to number two. The second reason is, is that the messages and lessons were very deep and engaging. While it is true that Nicktoons such as Doug and Rugrats had lessons such as lying or stealing is wrong or dealing with pressures from your peers, they were very simple. It was able to be very relatable to the audience, and kids took it to heart. Later on, Hey Arnold went even further with its messages from family neglect with Helga, addiction from Chocolate Boy, weight issues from Harold, voice change from Gerald, and the life of being an orphan from Arnold. However, it still was a lot more humorous and had charming moments that were showcased in the life of a kid growing up in the city. With that said, As Told by Ginger went even further with their messages. One of the first that really captured the realism of the show was that Ginger's family were divorced. This wasn't the first show to showcase divorce on Nickelodeon. Mr. Ernst from Hey Dude was the first one to claim that title. Although the wife was never seen or mentioned, nor did the son Buddy have any issues of missing his mom. Mr. Stevenson from The Journey of Alan Strange was also divorced, and the ex-wife did show up occasionally. The character of Robbie did showcase feeling alone and missing her mom, since she was now the mom of the house, taking care of her father and her younger brother. However, it was only shown in a few episodes. Robbie wasn't the main focus of the show, and they didn't put a lot of focus on it. The reason why was because it was mostly Alan's story of fitting in on Earth as an alien. 
Going into As Told by Ginger, in the episode Hello Stranger, Ginger receives a graduation letter from her father after not hearing from him for a long time. She still misses him and thinks about inviting him to the school function where she would read one of her original poems. The scene where Ginger pretends to call her dad and wonders what she's going to say, as well as the poem that she reads on catching up with her father on everything that's happened in her life that he missed out on, is probably one of the most touching moments in the entire series. Hi, Dad. This is Ginger. Hi, Dad. I'm calling because I got your letter. Hi, Dad. I was just looking at a picture of your leg and so thought I'd call. This is a poem for someone special. It's called Hello, Stranger. Hello, stranger. You came just in time. I look for your face in a crowd or in line. Hello, stranger. Not a moment too soon. See, that old picture's fading in the drawer of my room. Now toys have gone lost. Baby teeth have come loose. There were accidents involving stitches, spilt juice. Report cards were shown, and one time I got sick. But it's nothing I couldn't catch you up on real quick. In the episode Come Back Little Seal Girl, Ginger and Dodie are pressured into quitting the talent show because they wanted to perform a song that they've known since they were little girls and were concerned about whether it was cool to do it or not. I previously mentioned in my Top 15 as Told by Ginger episodes that there was an underlying message about the pressures of growing up. And while that is true, another message that the episode delivers was that you don't have to worry about what's cool in front of people's eyes. If you like doing it, then showcase on what you love and not be afraid of it. The scene where Macy performs the little seal girl in front of the entire middle school is one of the most memorable moments throughout the entire series, and probably even Macy's finest hour. I'm a little seal girl living in the real world, and it's so hard to get by. Seals can't even cry. Miranda? Is it me? Or is there something terribly endearing about her? But in this endless, boundless sea, is there no one who looks like me? I know I must stay chipper. One day I'll find a friend to hold my In the episode Gym Class Confidential, Macy is worried about watching a video about puberty at gym class since she's not comfortable about the subject. Also in the episode, Hoodsy is concerned about body issues when he's told by his gym teacher that they have to take mandatory showers after each class. Then there's the episode Losing Nana Bishop dealing with the death of a loved one, and she was gone dealing with the subtle message of suicidal depression, Wicked Game dealing with betrayal from best friends, uh, Butterflies Are Free dealing with change, and so on and so forth that I can keep going on and on about. The point is that the show was not afraid of dishing out the hard stuff that kids and teens go through. Because it taught its audience seriously, it was able to craft some of the most affecting stories ever presented on Nickelodeon, let alone an animated show for kids. Reason number three is that the show had a continuing narrative. Most shows on Nickelodeon had standalone episodes so that new viewers can easily watch a show and not feel completely lost. They ran for either 11 to 24 minutes that featured either a simple story of a character going through a problem only to have it solved by the end of the episode, and the next episode airing afterwards would have no mention or reference to said episode, or a wacky, crazy story filled to the brim with as much jokes as they could shoehorn in to keep their audience entertained and screaming for more. Now, not that I have issues with that whatsoever. I mean, I love watching those kind of shows. But if you were to tell me what kind of narrative I like in my TV shows, I love big storylines that continue throughout the entire show's run. If you see a commercial or hear about it through word of mouth about it, you're going to go see the first episode anyway. 
Now, granted, it was understandable that these kind of episodes were the norm back in the day, when on-demand, DVR, or even the internet didn't exist. The only way that kids can be able to see the shows in order is if you either saw it on its original air date, on reruns, from your friend's word of mouth, or if you recorded it on a VHS tape. But to its credit, some shows like Clarissa Explains It All, The Secret World of Alex Mack, the later seasons of Hey Arnold, and most of the Klasky Chupo Nicktoons did have some things that were in continuity of previous episode. However, it wasn't as consistent. As Told by Ginger was very consistent with its episodes. As Told by Ginger changed that from the moment that they aired episode 2. At the end of episode 1, Ginger and her friends were arrested after attempting to steal the enter sign from a bank to give to Courtney as a birthday present. In the first scene of episode 2, they acknowledged the previous episode right away. I really can't believe we have to do our community service at Golden Gate! I mean, come on! Could it be any less glamorous? Not supposed to be glamorous, jailbird. Try to steal the sign. Now you'll have to serve the time. In the grand majority of the time, they would reference previous events in later episodes to give the narrative of the series a steady flow. Another example would be about Carl's petrified eyeball. It was first mentioned in episode 1, where Blake asked for it in return of sharing information about Courtney inviting Ginger to her birthday party. Then, Carl and Hoodsy convinced Blake to visit their doghouse, clubhouse, saying that they'll hang out together. However, it was an elaborate trap with Carl and Hoodsy needing to get Blake out of the way so that they can use his treehouse to take pictures of the birthday parties so they can use it to blackmail people later on. Blake eventually gets free thanks to the family butler Winston, and in revenge, he steals the petrified eyeball. In episode 4, Carl plans on stealing back the petrified eyeball from Blake after he was invited to a sleepover. However, he releases a stink bomb at the Bishop House that drives away Joanne, the mother of Dodie and Hoodsy, and her book club away. With Carl grounded, Hoodsy is sent to steal the eyeball instead, and he succeeds. The eyeball was brought up more than once throughout the series, even all the way up to season 3 in the episode Butterflies Are Free, in which a girl named Polly convinces Carl to donate his petrified eyeball to his class's time capsule, since he wants to make his transition from elementary to middle school smoothly, with leaving his childhood antics behind. But then he changes his mind when he realizes he's not ready to grow up just yet and retrieves it again only for it to be consumed by a turkey they tried to save from being eaten in Thanksgiving in the episode 10 Chairs. Even small events were carried over. In the episode About Face, when Courtney throws a pebble at Dodie's bedroom window, it bounces back and it hits Mipsy's eye. Then in the following episode, the TV movie Butterflies Are Free, Mipsy is wearing an eye patch. Then there's the episode A Lesson in Tightropes, where Ginger went through appendicitis and was hospitalized. The next episode that follows it, Dodie's Big Break, we see Ginger looking weak with black circles under her eyes and a raspy voice. As previously mentioned in my top 15 As Told by Ginger episodes, there was a similar plot in an episode of The Wild Thornberries in which Eliza was suffering from appendicitis. Do you know what happened in the episode that followed afterward? Eliza is in perfect health and she's excited to be swimming with dolphins. If you're wondering, no, they never mention the appendicitis ever again throughout the entire series. Great. The majority of the episodes that were standalone were there to showcase a different character and what they were going through. Going into number four, the characters change and grow over time. Going back to the previous number and discussing about most Nickelodeon shows during the 90s being episodic, the characters also have to have little to no changes in their personality over the show's run to try to not lose their audience if they were watching a later episode as their very first. If you were to look at, say, the Rugrats characters, there's really not much of a difference between the first episode and the 100th episode, with the exception of the animation. Tommy's still the brave adventurer, Chucky is still the timid one, Phil and Lil are the gross twins who love eating worms, and Angelica is still the mean, bossy toddler. There may be some tweaks to their personality, but that's most likely due to the original writers and showrunner leaving after season 3 and having new people taking over as opposed to a plot that was thought through since the very beginning. As Told by Ginger was the exception to that rule, as growing up as a teenager was one of the main focuses of the show. 
One of the most praised things about As Told by Ginger was that the characters changed their clothes in almost every single episode. For the most part, cartoons wore the same clothes in every episode because it was cheaper to produce, similar to cartoon characters only having four fingers instead of five. Another reason may be for marketing purposes. A cartoon character that has a distinctive look that would transcend over time would eventually become iconic, and having a change would be jarring to the general public. For Doug, it's his green shirt, beige shorts, and orange sneakers. For Rocco, it's his triangle shirt. For Spongebob, it's his suit and tie. It's just as quick and easy to have toys featuring the characters with the same look as opposed to hundreds of looks. Unless you're Mattel, of course. As told by Ginger would average about two, three, or even four wardrobe changes in every episode, depending on the transition from another day, evening, or event. While there were previous animated shows such as The Weekenders and even anime such as Card Capture Sakura that showcased different outfits, it was As Told by Ginger that people bring up the most. The first thing is, is that the kid side, as in like Carl's perspective, is not as fleshed out as compared to, say, like Ginger's perspective in her teenhood. Uh, the thing of it is, is that, um, if you take a look at their clothes, for example, their clothes practically never change. They do occasionally for, like, the weather or for maybe, like, a school event, but for the most part, their clothes are pretty much the same. From what I've heard in an interview with Emily Kaepnick, uh, according to what she said, it was supposed to be, like, some sort of parody of the, the fact that clothes are constantly always the same. But the thing of it is, is that it would have been nice if maybe we would have seen the characters' clothes change from time to time. Maybe they didn't have the budget for it, but um, it would have been a nice touch. In my opinion, the diverse set of outfits was just the tip of the iceberg to the main sheer brilliance of what made this a rare set of events in an animated series perfected. As each season progressed, their looks also differed. Ginger's hair grew longer from season 1 through 3. Dodie's hairstyle changed, ditching the pigtails to having her hair being loose. Macy's hair became a bit more longer and stylized. It's just too bad that she didn't stick with her contact lenses and cola number 5 hair dye that she rocked out on in Butterflies Are Free. But the most drastic physical changes in the series were Lois's weight loss to prepare for her wedding, and Darren's headgear removal in Season 2, and his long hair and bulk up in Season 3. Even the personalities of the characters differed from each season. Ginger in Episode 1 was a mixture between an awkward 12-year-old 7th grader who wants nothing but to be portrayed as cool in front of the popular kids. Yet at the same time, she was confident enough to help her friends in time of need and able to speak her mind if she sees something going morally wrong. She even wanted to date the cute and popular boy Ian Richton, but she did have one-off relationships from Jean-Pierre, Joaquin, and Sasha. In episode 60, she doesn't care about being cool anymore. She focuses on being mostly herself, dealing with new issues in a new school. She has longer-lasting relationships with Darren and eventually Orion. She becomes more involved with school and said relationships, and a little less time spending with Dodie and Macy. In fact, one of the best changes that was done in season 3 was that after graduating from middle school and entering into high school, the trio of friends eventually went off to do different after-school activities. Dodie's trying to get into the cheerleading squad, Darren is joining the football team, Macy is joining the school band, and Ginger is joining a writing club. This is indeed a huge risk to take, since we've gotten so accustomed to seeing these group of friends together at Lucky Junior High for two whole seasons. For this show to bring them in high school and change things up to showcase what real life is was something that most animated shows didn't and still don't do. Sometimes we don't stay with the same group of friends forever. If we do, sometimes we don't stick around as often as we did in the past. Times change, schedules change, and most importantly, we change. We like different things. We experience things differently compared to others. Our hobbies change, and as time goes on, we meet new friends and leave behind old ones. It's not because we hate them. We just grow up. And sometimes we have to leave our past behind in order for us to see what the future holds. And sometimes it's even better than what we had before. That was really refreshing to see, and I wish more shows did that. One of the things that's very overlooked on As Told by Ginger was that the show can be very funny at times. While it's not chock full of gags or adult humor, it shines with its witty remarks and one-liners. They come in when you least suspect it and make you giggle or laugh out loud. Here are my favorite moments. You know how to, Dodie? I mean, kiss kiss? Of course I do. You be do swap saliva? And you kept this from me? Who are you? Well, I mean, I almost did it once. 
it's really simple. Um, you just do this. Bonjour, my little snow chickens. Oh. Oh, what do I have to go to the bathroom? That's what the newspaper's for, Hoodsy. Macy, please. It'll be really cool with the three of us and... Cool? Cool? Do I look like a girl who's concerned with what's cool? Uh, are you trying to escape? Because there's an easier... Escape? Heck no. The ninny from my insurance company just left, and I'm fixing to give him a proper send-off. Shut the door. Give me a hand. Is that him talking on the cell phone? Steady. Steady now. <laughs> Whoops. Not him. <laughs> that girl's gonna twist her spine all the way to the emergency room. Ginger, Dodie, the governor has declared a state of emergency. This is serious. We could run out of food. Oh, I'm telling you, this has all the makings of another daughter party. Now that would be cool. I bet I taste like chicken. Why would my best friends want to ruin something that makes me really happy? Why do they make children's aspirin so very difficult for the small children to open? You don't know the work it takes to keep a restaurant going. The competition is brutal, but the real culprit is all those cable cooking channels. They've convinced every amateur who ever boiled an egg that they can puff pastry just by watching someone else do it on TV. <sighs> Ginger, what are you doing here? I was invited, wasn't I? Yes, but it's 8.15. You said the party started at 8. You actually came on time? Oh, that's priceless. <laughs> Talk about your visual hyperbole. It's only a plastic surgery show for crying out loud. Yeah, and what's with the weird camera angles and choppy editing? It's like they're trying to create the illusion of tension when he's probably just going in for a nose job. Right on, Hoods. Don't they know we're the irony generation? Yeah. Nothing impresses us. But I've got homework of my own. Let me pretend I care. Okay, I'm done. Now, as great as that sounds, unfortunately, the show is not perfect. Granted, there is no such thing as a perfect show, but the thing of it is is that there are some noticeable flaws in it. And to be quite honest, not every single As Told by Ginger episode is flawless. There are a few episodes that suck, or very mediocre and forgettable. But since I did promise that this was going to be a video discussing about As Told by Ginger in an upbeat way, I will not say that here and now. I just want to let you know that not every episode of As Told by Ginger was perfect. There were some stinkers here and there, especially around season 3. That was when the show kind of took a nosedive. It could be possible due to the new writers not really knowing about... Um, the story of Ginger throughout the first two seasons, I'm not sure, but, and I'm not gonna call As Told by Ginger as, like, a masterpiece or anything like that, but I just wanted to point it out. All right, with me mostly gushing about this show throughout the entire video, you're probably wondering, it sounds great and all, but why don't more people talk about it? Ah, but there lies an even more longer set of explanations on why, in my personal opinion, the show became overlooked by classic Nick fans. The first reason was that it was a lot more dramatic than most Nicktoons at the time. Now, I know what you're thinking, but this was one of the most positive things about the show. What makes it so bad? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. But as I previously mentioned, most of the Nicktoons that aired at the time were comedic, with gags, fourth wall breaking, or subtle adult jokes. So when you have a show that's leaning more towards drama and less laughs, it becomes jarring to a lot of people because that's not what we expect from Nickelodeon. I even heard some people back in the day saying that because As Told by Ginger focused on everyday life, they found the show to be incredibly boring. Which, of course, is justified since kids want to relax and see something funny or action-packed when they come back from a long day of school. I even know people who hate Doug and Hey Arnold for the same reason. Plus, with As Told by Ginger featuring a female protagonist, brought to the attention that the show was going in this direction because it was for girls, and boys didn't want to be caught watching a girl show. Nickelodeon tried to do the same thing with their live-action shows, as well as featuring programs on SNCC, such as Caitlin's Way and Taina. In the end, they faded into obscurity for more or less the same reasons. 
Then again, this will be years before boys will be a lot more open-minded to saying that they liked watching shows with female protagonists, such as The Powerpuff Girls, Kim Possible, and more recently, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. The second reason I'm going to say this is that... The year 2000 was a terrible year for Nickelodeon, both for its new fans and especially its old ones. Going back to what I said previously, the year 2000 made it out to be way blown out of proportion because it was the new millennium. It was the future. However, when it came to the content that Nickelodeon released that year, pretty much every single one of them were hated or forgotten. The first one was Double Dare 2000, a revival to a classic game show from 1986. While it wasn't bad, it played it way too safe with the same format, same challenges, and same obstacle course. The only thing they changed was a different host in the form of Jason Harris and the new inclusion of the Triple Dare Challenge. Jason Harris was a decent host, but he was no Mark Summers. As for the Triple Dare Challenge, it was an all-around pointless and broken mechanic that grants the family triple the points if they succeeded on the physical challenge. It's like the golden snitch of Double Dare. It pretty much guarantees a win for one of the teams, even if they didn't deserve it. Everyone has made fun of this stupid inclusion, including Mark Summers in the episode Trouble Dare and Sanjay and Craig. The second show was Caitlin's Way, a show about a troubled orphan teenage girl named Caitlin moving in from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, moving into her mother's cousin and her family's home in Montana while struggling to fit in. As I stated with As Told by Ginger, Caitlin's Way was a much more dramatic show than the previous live action shows that were for the most part comedic, such as All That, Keenan and Kel, and The Amanda Show. I'll definitely have to talk about it in the future since that is my favorite underrated live action Nickelodeon show. The third show was The Brothers Garcia, a show where it focuses on a kid named Larry and his everyday life focusing on his family that's being narrated by his older self, who's voiced by John Leguizamo. Learned that Planet Cool wasn't a real place, it was a state of mind. So as far as I was concerned, La Casa Garcia was Planet Cool for me. Todo para la familia. Everything for the family. Hollywood! Sounds familiar? Yes. It was the exact same premise of The Wonder Years, which took that style of narration from A Christmas Story. The only noteworthy thing about The Brothers Garcia was that it was the very first show ever to be created, written, produced, directed, and portrayed by Hispanics. So while groundbreaking for its time of portraying a different culture on TV, the overall package was very average and nothing out of the ordinary, which made it forgotten by many people really quickly. The fourth show was its first Nicktoon of 2000, Pelswick. Pelswick was about a disabled kid named Pelswick living his everyday life with going to school, hanging out with his family and friends, and interacting with his useless guardian angel, Mr. Jimmy. While watching Pelswick, I get a huge Doug vibe from it. The average protagonist we're supposed to relate to, the girl he has a crush on but she has absolutely no clue about it, the dumb bully who says idiotic insult, and a crazy over-the-top grandma. Considering that this was created by the same man who did this, and this, and this, Pelswick is a very watered-down version of his artistic work and an overall forgotten and bland Nicktoon that nobody remembers. It's like if Invader Zim, created by Joan and Vasquez, would turn into this. Ah, get that away from me! The fifth show was Noah Knows Best, a live-action show that focuses on a teenage boy named Noah that lives his everyday life that includes his parents, annoying little sister, and friends while he talks about everything that's going on to the viewing audience breaking the fourth wall. Gee, doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, it's a Clarissa Explains It All ripoff. In fact, this show was so bad that it was canceled three months after its airing, only showing eight out of its 13th episodes. Even still to this day, No One Knows Best has not aired any reruns on any of their channels. Not even on the 90s or all that, or the splat. It even had the record of being the shortest aired Nickelodeon show, until five years later, with Rugrats Preschool Days only having four episodes in the span of four days. The first Nickelodeon movie that debuted in 2000 was Snow Day. It focuses on three different perspectives. A teenage boy who wants to confess his love to a popular girl that doesn't even know he exists. His younger sister who wants to stop a snow plowing man for getting rid of all the snow in the street and having them going back to school. And showcasing the adults consisting of their parents who's an overworked mom having to watch over their little brother, and their father, who's a news reporter trying to see if he can cover the news the best, 
as opposed to a competing weatherman who's doing a much more superior job. This was originally supposed to be a feature film based off of the adventures of Pete and Pete. However, due to the fact that the original actors from the show grew too old to portray their roles, as well as a massive delay of the movie coming out, and Paramount having the script changed for it to be more for a general audience, the movie was released with mixed to negative results, and in my opinion is an overall forgettable and bland movie. Which is crazy to think that this movie was written by the same people who did The Adventures of Pete and Pete and Kablam. The only thing memorable about 2000 for Nickelodeon was the release of the Rugrats in Paris movie. A film, in my opinion, is vastly superior to the original Rugrats movie. But then 2001 would come along, and it would deliver much better Nicktoons, such as The Fairly Odd Parents and Invader Zim. And then throughout the early 2000s, it would deliver much more remembered Nicktoons, such as My Life as a Teenage Robot, Chalk Zone, Danny Phantom, and Avatar The Last Airbender. That's just for the new generation. What about the old generation that grew up with 90s Nickelodeon? (laughs) Well, as I mentioned before, they were treated even worse. SNCC took a massive downfall around 2000, with three very popular programs being canceled that very same year. All that... Are You Afraid of the Dark, and Keenan and Kel. They were later replaced by shows such as The Amanda Show, Caitlin's Way, The Brothers Garcia, and the occasional movie. SNCC never really regained its glory ever again, despite being around for a few more years until its end in 2004. Also, the majority of the shows that aired in the 90s were already off the air due to either being cancelled or ending its run. With that, the teens most likely went off to other channels suited more for them. Since Nickelodeon had that motto of, Nick is kids, teens might have felt that Nickelodeon was just not for them anymore and eventually moved on. Oh, what I'd get for the good old days. The third reason, and I know this is probably going to be an insult for a lot of you people, but... Klasky Chupo and their animation. I will not deny that hands down the worst thing about As Told by Ginger is the animation. The body and facial expressions are hideous with the mouths being all the way down their faces, the heads are too small or too big for their bodies, their eyes are too wide, and there's some very cringeworthy scenes that occur throughout the series. Around the 90s and mid-2000s, Klasky Chupo was one of the biggest animation studios of all time, creating, animating, and producing a ton of cartoons that would become critically acclaimed hits. The most successful out of all of them would be Rugrats. Rugrats for a time was like Spongebob Squarepants. It ran for over a decade with two spin-offs, three movies, a ton of merchandise, and currently being the only Nickelodeon show to have a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But as time went on, people became burned out with Rugrats. It was constantly airing all the time, there were character editions that many people didn't care about, and the later shows, such as All Grown Up and Rugrats Preschool Days, it had mixed to negative reviews from critics and viewers. After the huge success of Rugrats, it seemed that Klasky Chupo tended to lean more of directing certain audiences and not a general run. Aura Monsters were for people who liked monsters and gross-out humor. Rocket Power were for people who loved extreme sports like skateboarding or surfing. The Wild Thornbirds were for people who loved nature shows and animals. As Told by Ginger were for mostly older kids and teenagers. All Grown Up were for people who grew up with Rugrats. Preschool Days was for... Um... Uh, well, uh, let's face it, nobody. It was just Nickelodeon trying to squeeze whatever popularity Rugrats had left in 2008. And while it's a huge problem with their shows constantly running for this long, that wasn't their biggest issue. When we look back on a lot of the shows that they were a part of, their animation is very odd-looking. When you consider that Gabor Chupo is Hungarian and learned about animation in his home country, you can see why it looks so much more different than other animated shows at the time. And they were very, very particular of how their style of animation looked. According to Eric Malinsky, who was a storyboard artist on Klasky Chupo from 1999 to 2002, he claimed that the designs had to look exactly how Klasky Chupo's designs were. Otherwise, they would be heavily criticized. And while I praise Gabor Chupo and a lot of the animators for showcasing different animation, sometimes different doesn't mean good. The animation of Klasky Chupo hasn't aged very well. Most artists, animators, and animation enthusiasts criticize their animation for being incredibly unwatchable and ugly. I'm not one of those people who flat out hate Klasky Chupo's animation. I think it could be done brilliantly if the show takes advantage of their designs. 
The two best examples are, believe it or not, Duckman and All Real Monsters. Duckman was a dark comedy that had surreal moments mixed with social commentary. All Real Monsters had some of the most creative-looking monsters that focused mostly on a garbage dump where it relied on a lot of gross-out moments. When they try to do simple slice-of-life shows like Rugrats or As Told by Ginger, then it becomes very noticeable, with their latter being the worst out of their Nicktoons lineup. Eventually, people became burned out from Klasky Chupo and were later won off by the other Nicktoons around the early to mid-2000s when As Told by Ginger was still airing. Unfortunately, that wasn't the main problem. Which brings us to number four. As Told by Ginger's airing time was very inconsistent. When it first debuted around October 25th, 2000, it had aired new episodes every Wednesday until January of 2001. Around that time, a brand new block was introduced to Nickelodeon. It was called Teen Nick. They would air programs for teenagers every Sunday night. With As Told by Ginger gaining po popularity with critics and viewers at the time, it was moved to that time slot until 2003 when season 2 was just wrapping up. But then things became even more complicated. The schedule changed again with it airing around selective mornings with only half of season 3 being aired until it was moved to the Nicktoons network where they would continue to air reruns and two new episodes. What? But then the final eight episodes never aired in the U.S. and was only shown on Canada, the United Kingdom, and other countries. Now, there hasn't been a confirmed reason as to why the episodes have never been aired. Some say it was due to the show's popularity dwindling down. Others say that the content was getting too dark and dramatic to be shown on Nickelodeon. Whatever the reason, fans of the show wouldn't get to see Season 3 until years later in 2008 when they were released on iTunes alongside with other classic 90s and early 2000s Nickelodeon shows as a part of Nick Rewind. Yeah, remember that? For me, I didn't get to see the second half of season 3 until many years later, with the first one that I saw being the final episode, The Wedding Frame, on DVD back in 2010. With the air date being incredibly inconsistent, most people couldn't keep up with As Told by Ginger's later episodes, especially with it being moved to another channel that didn't come with a lot of cable providers at the time. Since On Demand, Netflix, Hulu, and even YouTube didn't exist yet, it was very hard to keep up with the show unless you had the Nicktoons network, or knew a friend who had it. With that, the show eventually stopped airing, and quickly became forgotten for many years. Even still to this day, it's Klasky Chupo's least talked about Nicktoon, and it's one of the most obscure Nickelodeon shows that was ever released. I can go on and on about how much of an absolute shame it was that As Told by Ginger was left in the wayside. Many people couldn't accept the animation. Many people weren't interested in watching a show that didn't rely on jokes or a flowing narrative. Many people didn't want to watch a show that featured females. Or maybe we just weren't ready for a show like this. Maybe the show was just way too ahead of its time for people to truly appreciate its unique beauty and strong deep morals and messages. Whatever the case was, it did not deserve to be treated the way it was back in 2000. But it seems that a lot of people's opinions on the show has changed in recent years. A lot of people are rediscovering or discovering it for the first time and found it to be a really amazing show that spoke to people in a way that most cartoons didn't, and for the most part, still don't. Dedicated fan websites such as As Told by Ginger Reviewed, Ginger Snaps, and Cats Games and Books review every single episode of the show and discuss about the best and worst things about it. Well-written articles such as Sarah Steinfeld from TheGloss.com, Cameron Glover from ThoughtCatalog.com, Julia Pugachevsky from BuzzFeed Rewind, Kelsey Hurston from TheOdysseyOnline.com, and even Passion Tune has discussed on why As Told by Ginger left a massive impact on the portrayal of everyday life of an animated show, as well as what the show meant to them. Online YouTubers have discussed on their opinions of the show. So overall, this show is just excellent in its execution, and it's no surprise of why I'm going to give this show a well-deserved 5 out of 5 stars. This is a show that you really have to really watch, and despite the fact that it did get some negative reviews, I have to say that this is a show that you have to immediately watch because it's so well-meaning and just so full of heart that I could really recommend it to anyone from ages no matter what your age is, it can be watched by anyone. But yeah, it is really great, really funny. Not funny as in, I'm going to roll all over the floor dying with laughter funny, but it's cute. It is, it's really nice. It's, I think it still fits in with the time today, even though it was a couple of, you know, it was 
eight, nine, ten years ago. But it does fit in, I think it's really good. But for me, the highlight is the theme tune. I still watched it after the theme tune aired. I would carry on still watching it. But I just absolutely love it. It's brilliant, yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I had it in my mind that I wanted to rewatch uh, As Told by Ginger because I remember really enjoying the show as a kid, believe it or not. Uh, as, a, as a young teenage male, I actually enjoyed watching that show. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember there, was a, there were a couple later seasons that I never got the chance to, uh, to watch. So I thought, hey, you know what? Why not? I should give this a shot. So I tracked down the episodes, and uh, I marathoned pretty much the entire show and the, and the Camp Capri special and all that stuff. And, um, man, if, if, if any of those shows hold up the best, I would say As Told by Ginger does even more than Rugrats. It certainly wasn't as, as you know, I mean, it was successful, but it wasn't like Rugrats level of successful. But what a, what a smart show. Like, truly, what, what, a, what an intelligently, realistically written show. Even people such as the previously mentioned Eric Malinsky asked on why people didn't watch As Told by Ginger since he felt it was incredibly underrated. It's also helped thanks to the Splat airing As Told by Ginger episodes back in October 2015. Pretty much every single episode was uploaded on YouTube for people to watch and being one of the many classic Nick shows airing on Nick Reboot. The people who saw As Told by Ginger and praised it were for the most part the people who grew up with it as kids, and not people like me who watched it when they were teenagers. It seems that people are no longer afraid to state that they liked As Told by Ginger, which is great! Like cult classic with dedicated fan bases like Earthbound, it was a cartoon that was misunderstood when it first came out. But as the years pass and cartoons that mixes comedy with drama, such as Adventure Time, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, Gravity Falls, and Steven Universe, are being the most popular on TV right now, As Told by Ginger still holds up brilliantly today and is seen as a trend center that was way ahead of its time. Sure, it took over 15 years for people to finally see the greatness of his show, but I think it was well worth it, and I'm enjoying every moment of it. So I just want to say thank you so much, Emily Kapnick. You created a show that you based heavily on your own life experiences and that you inspired and influenced a lot of people. Someone once told me the grass is much greener On the other side Then I paid a visit While it's possible I missed it It seemed different, yeah, exactly the same yeah, 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 yeah. Someone once told me the grass is much greener 